use here because this is really just a, a wonderful opportunity to be a part of this broader set of conversations that you all have been having throughout the year uh, and that are going to be ongoing, it sounds like, for the rest of the semester. Um, I've been able to watch these sort of from afar uh, and sort of keep track of, of what's been going on and I've been telling everybody how jealous I am that I haven't been able to be here uh, to actually see all of these uh, and participate uh, fully in all of the discussions. Um, but it's such a privilege to be able to lend my voice um, to this broader conversation that we are all now uh, engaged in, looking at some really critical issues uh, that are not only deeply relevant to our current circumstances today, but as Professor Goldman suggested, really span national and transnational boundaries across the centuries. And then putting all of these iterations of the ghetto into conversation uh, is something that I think is of great historical import um, and is a really exciting conversation. Uh, to be having and certainly to be a part of. So thank you both to Professor Goldman and to Professor Trotter uh, for inviting me to be a part of this series and for the work that you've done to put this together. Uh, thank you to Hikari for helping to make sure that I actually got here, which was something of an adventure, uh, but her logistical support uh, and help has been uh, invaluable and is the reason why I can actually be standing here. Uh, and to all of you for participating uh, in this conversation and these larger conversations really throughout the course of the semester. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to your thoughts and comments and to engaging in a broader discussion uh, about what I've written here, but also about the larger themes um, that seem to have been developing over the course of the year. I've been asked to provide a little bit of context um, for the paper that we are discussing. Um, and this piece really grows out of the research that I did for my first book, uh, which is now, now actually titled Unjust Deeds, The Restrictive Covenant Cases and the Making of the Civil Rights Movement. The marketing folks felt that that might sell a few more copies. That, <laughs> that title has been, been growing on me, uh, so, so I, I like it now, and that's, that's the new one. And that's going to be coming out this fall through University of North Carolina Press through their Justice, Power, and Politics series, and that is my one shameless plug uh, for the day, so forgive me that. Uh, this project was really an effort to recover from the margins of civil rights history a campaign that I argue ultimately served as a critical turning point for civil rights litigation and for the broader struggle for racial equality in American life. Here, activists challenged the tightening bonds of residential segregation and the entrenchment of the American ghetto in a series of cases from across the country that reached the Supreme Court of the United States in 1947 and were then heard in January of 1948 and then decided in May of 1948. Uh, Shelley B. Kramer from St. Louis, McGee v. Sipes, which is obviously featured much more significantly in this particular paper uh, from Detroit, Heard v. Hodge and Ursiolo v. Hodge from Washington, D.C. And they all go up to the Supreme Court together. They're heard simultaneously, and they're ultimately decided simultaneously, though in two different decisions, uh, one for the Washington cases because they fall under federal law, and one for the state cases uh, because they are decided under state law. Uh, so two decisions, but they are effectively viewed as a unit. Uh, in these conversations, these four cases, and six African-American families are ultimately bound up in the same struggle. Ultimately, the project is then trying to grapple with urban, urban activists' efforts to stop the enforcement and spread of instru instruments called racial restrictive covenants, which, as I hope I've made clear in the paper, are these legal tools designed to uphold residential segregation in the United States and are really spread throughout urban areas. They are agreements formed between white homeowners, their clauses inserted into property deeds by white home builders that effectively bar uh, a specified set of racial, racial, ethnic, and religious minorities from owning or occupying designated properties in various neighborhoods across the country. One of the important arguments that I'm making in this paper and in the larger project is that restrictive covenants are really being seen as a critical instrument of racial segregation, that they are a foundational part of the American ghetto and a critical threat to the progress of African American communities in the post-war period. Now this actually conflicts with the interpretations of some of the leading historians of urban segregation, particularly Arnold Hirsch and Tom Segrew, who have largely treated restrictive covenants as a vestigial facet of earlier segregation efforts that were unequal to the task of actually maintaining residential color lines by the time we reached the 1940s. Uh, uh, Tom Segrew calls them uh, effectively the least effective modern method of residential segregation. But I think this more innocuous interpretation of Covenant's importance actually doesn't give enough credit 
to the opinions and the efforts of activists and observers at the time. And, and you've got a handful of quotes that are actually in the paper uh, from this immediate post-war period, basically highlighting how dangerous African-American activists and, and those who are studying this question of urban segregation really view restrictive covenants as being, how central they see restrictive covenants uh, are in the larger sort of sweep of residential segregation in the United States and the hardening boundaries of America's racial ghettos. More than just sort of saying that we need to pay attention to what activists are saying at the time, I think that treatments of residential segregation that discount the relevance or importance of restrictive covenants actually seem to fall into the habit of viewing the outcome and, and what I think we can agree is, is effectively the failure of the Shelley decision to end residential segregation as something of an inevitability. To set aside or to ignore the contingencies, though, that contemporary activists saw in the emergence and the solidification of the ghetto, to focus purely on what the Shelley decision did not ultimately do, I think misses a few critical points <coughs> that are important for us to remember. The first is that activists largely believed in this moment, particularly in this post-war moment, that the ghetto was in fact a mutable and vulnerable institution. This was not uh, something that was naive or foolhardy, it was not an act of willful blindness. This was something that was genuinely felt and they sensed that there was a way to actually break down these walls and that attacking restrictive covenants was going to be a critical part of that endeavor. That if you could take restrictive covenants out of this equation that you might be able to uproot and yank out these sort of stubborn roots of residential segregation that had sunk themselves pretty deep into the soil of America's cities at this point in time. Uh, Charles Abrams, who I quote briefly in the paper, uh, says that, that if we allow restrictive covenants to retain their enforcement, the ability to be enforced and their impact in America's urban areas, that we are effectively guaranteeing that the ghetto will become a permanent institution in American life. But part of that quote is to suggest that he views the ghetto as being impermanent in this moment, that it is something that can actually be combated. It's something that we can break down, and that's ultimately what he is trying to become involved in at this moment as well, along with a number of other folks. The second point that I think we miss when we view the, the Shelley decision as an inevitable failure is that this lack of contingency discounts the possibility that the American ghetto really could have been, in fact, much worse. This is something that uh, uh, students of social change litigation encourage us to pay attention to, that we need to actually think about these potential hypothetical outcomes as we are envisioning what uh, uh, social change litigation may actually achieve in partial victories. All right, so, so a number of African American activists are, are writing and thinking from the 1920s all the way up to the moment that the restrictive covenant cases are decided in 1948 that the inevitable result of the continued enforcement and spread of racial restrictive covenants will ultimately be the barring of all, a complete urban area, of, of all of a certain town, maybe eventually all of a particular state, or perhaps all of the entire country, that African Americans might be legally exiled from the United States if we allow restrictive covenants to continue their spread and to carry the sanction of America's courts, the federal government, the real estate industry, the banking industry, and individual white homeowners. And if we allow this to continue, we might wind up with something that's much more akin in many respects to what we see in apartheid South Africa, for instance. That the American ghetto could have looked even more like that than it does wind up looking at, uh, that it does wind up actually becoming in many senses. And third, I think this third point is that the ferocity and ingenuity of white resistance to this decision in Shell was something that no one really seemed to anticipate fully. It was not that they imagined that once the Supreme Court made this decision and they had this unexpected victory, that suddenly the walls of the ghetto would come crumbling down and everybody would live together in harmony as next door neighbors. They anticipated a longer battle, a longer struggle. But they didn't actually anticipate the extent and effectiveness, the ferocity and tenacity of white resistance to the implementation of this decision. African Americans actually succeed in the wake of the restrictive covenant case decision in Shelley in 1948 
in obtaining greater access to homes. They actually significantly expand sections of cities that they are able to find housing in. Tens of thousands of African American families within about five years of the decision are now in homes that would, had previously been barred to them before this decision was made. Housing access, which was always a core part of this struggle, actually became something of a reality. But housing desegregation, housing integration, which was another piece of this battle, never really came about. And that, I think, actually tells us less about the ineffectiveness of covenants in the 1940s and much more about the tenacity and ferocity of white segregation in residential areas. Uh, what I call in the larger project some of the most indelible color lines that are drawn in the 20th century. Right? They become innovatively defended in a lot of respects. If we need further evidence of the fact that Americans at this time and the participants in the cases really viewed the restrictive covenant cases as being critical, that they thought that they were revolutionizing the future trajectory of race relations in American society, we can look at the Supreme Court itself. The Supreme Court justices who made this decision genuinely believed that they were transforming the field of civil rights law and that this would help to bring an end to racial injustice in the nation. Before Fred Vinson, uh, Chief Justice Fred Vinson actually delivered his opinion in which he read the entirety of his opinion out loud uh, from his seat in the Supreme Court, which was rare at the time. You normally just gave a sort of brief overview, the bullet points, and said read it when it actually comes out gave a quick synopsis, but he goes to the effort of reading the entire decision. Frank Murphy, one of the other justices on the court, writes him a handwritten note just before he delivers this and says, these cases, this opinion is going to make you immortal, that this is going to be remembered and celebrated throughout American history from this point forward as being a turning point in American race relations, right? I'm paraphrasing that last part, but he says that these cases are going to make you immortal. Justice Harold Burton, who makes a brief cameo in the paper as well, also writes to Vinson in one of the draft opinions and says that what you've done here is remarkable. You've now reinvigorated the 14th Amendment, the spirit of racial justice in American society, and the, the, the uh, purpose of this court as the living voice of the Constitution. So the Supreme Court justices themselves believed that this was going to transform the way in which racial segregation operated in American society. So my argument then, in a larger sense, is that there has to be more to this story than we have traditionally given. It's been more than 50 years since the last full-length treatment of the restrictive covenant cases. That with this, this much smoke, there has to be some fire. And one of the ways that we can get at what there is to look, uh, what there is to see, is to look much more closely at the conduct of the cases themselves. That we can look at the process of how this litigation campaign ultimately developed, and take a look in a much more holistic sense at what this battle against restrictive covenants was really about. And my goal, in a larger sense, has been to understand how activists wrestled with these issues to find out what historians might be able to recover from this largely forgotten or marginalized campaign. One of the arguments then that my project is making is to suggest that there are valuable and important insights that emerge by taking a more in-depth and expansive look at legal cases from the ground up, that our perspective on litigation campaigns matters considerably in our abil ability to evaluate their significance beyond the sort of pure uh, metrics of outcomes and the words, the specific words, of the Supreme Court. I think we see a number of things by adopting this approach. We can see the impact of the law upon individuals and individuals' impact upon the law. Right? We see the interaction of local communities with sort of abstract legal principles and processes, the ways in which they actually help to shape these litigation campaigns that oftentimes seem so divorced from the grassroots histories that have come to give us such a rich perspective of the civil rights movement. I think we also see the power in arguments and strategies and processes that don't really appear in Supreme Court opinions, but that nonetheless are shaping the results of the cases and that signal some important potential uses of the law as an instrument of resistance. Right? The, the human rights arguments that the NAACP is making in the restrictive covenant cases uh, really don't appear in the court's opinion. They, they sort of keep the grounds elsewhere. The United Nations Charter appears very briefly in one footnote in the uh, uh, Washington cases, but apart from that, there's not really an acknowledgement of all of these international arguments that the NAACP is making in the build-up to these cases. And yet, as I hope I've been able to convince you, at least in part, 
these human rights claims, this mobilization of an idea of an international crisis, really does play a critical part in how the Supreme Court will ultimately arrive at its conclusion, even if it doesn't acknowledge it in the words of the opinion itself. And lastly, I think that adopting this perspective is important because it helps us to see the possibilities that activists saw in cases, it helps us to understand what they hoped for, and that these aspirations really matter. They help to reveal the purpose and the intent of the activists themselves. They give us a, a truer sort of uncut sense of what civil rights movement lawyers and, and participants were really trying to achieve, what kind of society they envisioned. And there's power in understanding that, regardless of whether or not it actually comes to full fruition. And so that, finally, after a rather long-winded end here, uh, brings me to the paper that we're discussing today. And this project grew out of one of these recurrent themes that starts to become apparent from taking a closer look at the way in which the cases were fought and an effort to understand how civil rights activists interpreted and framed the issue of residential segregation. I became fascinated with the ways in which legal activists began to use the language and law of human rights in their arguments about the responsibilities of courts, the federal government, and the nation as a whole with respect to racial segregation and particularly these hardening boundaries of the racial ghetto. As I looked deeper into Shelley, I kept coming across these arguments that were rooted in appeals to an emergent idea of human rights that portrayed the American racial ghetto as a particularly consequential and urgent human rights crisis with profound international implications. The Shelley campaign understood that they needed some way to upset the usual balance of American jurisprudence, particularly this deference to claims involving private property rights, which were effectively sacrosanct in a lot of respects. They lobbed an array of arguments in an effort to supersede these traditionally very powerful claims, but among the most frequent and among the most radical in their, implica in their implications were those that invoked this concept of human rights. There were really two dimensions, I think, to these claims, although there were a number of different ways in which they were deployed. The first was an attempt to frame the racial ghetto itself as a crisis that was the subject of human rights law something that we could directly apply the United Nations Charter to, for instance. And the second was to frame the ghetto as a crisis of American public policy, as a fundamental challenge to the nature of justice in American society. And it's really important to note that this theme of justice versus the law really comes up a lot in the discussion of these cases on both sides of these arguments. There's a constant sort of debate going on about whether we should privilege this notion of justice as we are coming to define it in this post-war context, or if it's legal precedent that should ultimately hold the greatest sway. It's also important to note that the NAACP and local litigators, as I tried to get across in the paper here, were truly hoping to invent and shape the nature of human rights arguments in the post-war courts, that they did not just pick up some fully formed <coughs> instrument that had been laid out for them, but they were in fact trying to shape the substance and interpretations and the uses of these human rights arguments themselves that they really wanted to, to have a say, have a voice in transforming what human rights law could be in the post-war moment. Shelley was unique in many respects amongst these early civil rights cases in providing these human rights claims. And this sets it apart as a starting point for a radical imagination of what the law could be as an instrument of liberation in the post-war period. It was, in the end, this portrayal and common understanding of the crisis brewing in the nation's racial ghettos that played a critical role in not only the disposition of the cases themselves and the court's opinion on this, but it also helped to foment a broader set of changes within the civil rights movement's legal sphere, new coalitions, a partnership with the federal uh, government, and particularly the Department of Justice, uh, and the use of social scientific data in new ways. All of these have at least some linkage to this question of human rights. Uh, the racial ghetto proved to be a uniquely threatening and powerful institution and image to mobilize around. It spurred the development of these new claims, these new coalitions, and a broader appeal to these notions of justice in the American legal system. Uh, there's plenty more to talk about here, but I want to leave plenty of time, and, and I'm sensitive to the fact that I can get a little long-winded. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude with just a, a, a brief statement here. At its heart, my, my sort of fundamental purpose with this project, um, but with the larger project, is to recover the importance of the stories belonging to families like the McGee's. I really want to put them at the heart uh, of these larger narratives about legal processes and legal change. 
I want to look at the work of local litigators like Lauren Miller or Willis Graves and Francis Dent. I want to look at the imagined futures that these individuals and then larger organizations like the NAACP were fighting for. I think that doing this can not only provide insights into the trajectories and the evolution of civil rights activism during its mid-20th century heyday, and also the mechanisms and the nature of that evolution and reform, the, the, the processes by which we actually see change, but it can also bring to us a richer sense of the hope, the urgency, and the optimism that characterized much of this moment of advocacy, this incredibly tumultuous period. It's a reminder of how insistence and innovation would ultimately help tens of thousands of African American families to feel what one contemporary called the bright sunlight of human rights. There'd be a lot of fighting left to do, as you'll no doubt see over the rest of this fantastic series, uh, but urban activists found new ways to test the limits of the American racial ghetto in these years, and the story of their efforts and their hopes for the future matter a great deal. So with that, I will, I will turn things over to all of you, and I'm very much looking forward to your thoughts and comments. Thank you.